this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share and reuse what is available online and offline. The journey will make many stops, interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians and publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers, to ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Katarina Trendacosta. She is the Associate Director of Policy and Activism at EFF, where she can coordinates EFF, uh, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, where she coordinates EFF's federal activism. Her areas of expertise are competition, broadband access, intellectual property, net neutrality, fair use, free speech online, and intermediate, intermediary liability. Before joining EFF, Katarina spent many years as a writer and editor at the science fiction and science website io9 <clears throat> so hi katarine welcome hello thanks for having me so so glad to have you on this uh, on this podcast series hi shall we just get started sure yeah let's let's get into it <laughs> sure okay <laughs> let's start with a topic that's been mentioned on several previous episodes of this podcast series uh, the digital millennium, millennium copyright act uh, which is dates from uh, 1998 and uh, is in, is referred to also as to the which is referred to also as the dmca um it has been mentioned before here in this podcast but it's mainly because it's considered a foundational law that shaped the internet as we know it, uh, not only in the US, but worldwide. Um, you, the reason why I'm asking about this is because in 2020, you published an evaluation, uh, like um, 20 years later. So can you just briefly guide us through what Sorry. the elements we're keeping are of this um, the MCA and what are the parts that now 20 years on need to be fixed or retaught? Sure. Um, I would note that so at EFF, um, I wrote and we published an evaluation of the DMCA 20 years later, not just because we were interested in evaluating the law 20 plus years later, but because there's been an effort in the American Congress and the American Copyright Office to look at the DMCA. And we believed and we were proved correct that the assumptions by both those bodies about the copyright law and how it's affected people would be badly skewed by those with the most money, which regular internet users tend not to, to count as. And we wanted to make sure that the independent and small creators and internet users' feelings about the DMCA were also recorded somewhere. So. The DMCA has sort of two major parts. Um, the one that is the most famous is Section 512. That's the one that releases platforms from liability for copyright infringement as long as they do certain things. And famously, one of those things is if they get a takedown request, they have to take something down. They also have to have some sort of repeat infringer policy to disable the accounts of people who have gotten multiple takedowns. Um, so those are there are other requirements, but those are the ones that most people run into. They put something up online, someone claims they have a copyright in it, it goes down. Um, the other part of it is Section 1201 of the DMCA, which makes it illegal to break any sort of control on copyrighted material. Um, its intended purpose was to make it so that people couldn't pirate DVDs. But at this point, it's basically anything. Most things have something copyrighted in it and most things have some sort of control and this law makes it illegal to break it. Even if you have a right to use the material, you no longer have a right to access the material. Uh, and then every three years, you can ask the Library of Congress for an exemption. That process is very bizarre. Um, so in both cases, 1201 should be junked entirely. 1201 doesn't work. Um, 1201 is the reason you can't repair your own devices. It's the reason that farmers were finding their tractors disabled because they couldn't repair them themselves um, without getting a, John, a registered John Deere person to do it. So 1201 just jumped entirely. 512 is, is different. Without 512, 
it would be incredibly difficult for anyone to host third party content um, for fear of being held liable for their infringement activities. It, it just happens to be the way it is. You can't uh, host the material of other people if you are concerned that you will be held liable for their material. This goes, this is down the line. This is basically everyone. What does need to be changed is that the DMCA, as it is currently written, is very bad at discouraging bad faith takedowns. That is, takedowns that are sent for the purpose of suppressing speech rather than for the purpose of actually taking down copyright infringement. Uh, takedowns are supposed to be for copyright infringement and copyright infringement is very, there are like, there are factors you're supposed to weigh, but what it comes down to is, is this a copy that people are accessing and using instead of the original? Does it replace the original? Um, does it replace the market for the original? So is it a free copy of something you, sh you should be paying for? That's not the same thing as the as a review of something that contains parts of the things that are being reviewed. Um, that is not infringement, mm -hmm. and that is obviously not infringement because cultural criticism has been around for centuries. Uh, and quoting snippets of the thing that you are criticizing to prove your point is not only a habit, it's what at least I was taught to do when I was in high school and being taught uh, how to write an English paper and amass evidence on my side was to quote from the authorities I was using. And if that were infringement, we would all be poorer for it. We would make poorer arguments. So that's sort of the problem is there is not the, the DMCA has a way in theory you're supposed to be able to get redress, but it requires you to have a lawyer and be willing to go to court and be willing to go up against companies that have billions of dollars when you don't. Um, and that's really frustrating. The other part of it that's that's really frustrating is nothing in the DMCA requires people to take into account fair use before they send the takedown. Um, and in fact, case law has said that as long as the people who sent the takedown think it's infringement, like as long as they have a good faith belief that it's infringement, they can send the takedown without violating the, the statute for, for Burgess takedowns. And that's a problem because what it means is if you are sending takedowns, you are better off not researching what's allowed and what isn't. You are better off believing that someone saying something bad about your work is infringement when that is definitely not it. Um, because then you can argue in court that that's what you believed and it counts. And so there's no mechanism that requires people to know what fair use is and to sort of apply it and say, this person may be saying negative things about me. That's not fair use. I mean, that's not copyright infringement. This person may be using this thing I made without permission, but if they're using it in a, as part of a fair use, that is also not copyright infringement. Um, People remixing culture is how culture grows. That's why fair use exists, is to allow copyright law to exist in a country which also has a First Amendment. Okay, thanks. Let's um, let's continue on a related topic. Um, everybody's favorite uh, YouTube feature, um, upload filter. So um, you wrote a report also in 2020. Uh, it's called Unfiltered, how YouTube's content ID discourages fair use and dictates what we see online. Uh, we will link in the metadata of this podcast episode for people who want to read it themselves. Um, so this is obviously also relevant in the context of the rollout of the European Copyright Directive and its infamous mm -hmm. Article 17, which has also been featured uh, in ten, uh, a lot of times on this podcast before. Um, so the idea behind is that this should, this should preserve user exceptions, which is sort of a EU, EU light version of fair use. Um, 
could you maybe briefly explain how upload filters work in general, how they work on YouTube, sure. and what are the lessons that you've drawn from your uh, research into this particular topic, uh, especially when it comes to automated content filters? Um, uh, we always obviously think of YouTube as the main platform applying this, right. but a lot of platforms are. Pretty much all of the major ones do. Facebook has one. Um, YouTube obviously has one. If you're uploading to, to many websites, they have some form of it. Um, even if you're uploading to like Scribd and its documents, they have an upload filter as well to check to see if you're uploading a document that someone else owns. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these filters work on the same basic premise which is that they scan an upload to see if there's anything in the upload that matches something that they have on file in the library. Uh, that, in theory, you feel like it should make sense. If this thing that has been uploaded is an exact copy of this other thing that we have in the library, that's copyright infringement. But these filters don't check to see if what has been uploaded is the entire work. Um, matches have been made on seconds of a match, which is a problem because you can use little bits of something as a fair use and it wouldn't be copyright infringement, but the filter doesn't know that because filters can't, these filters aren't taking into context anything. All they are doing is seeing if this small part of something matches some other small part of something. And if there is a match, the thing that's being uploaded can be blocked, demonetized. Sometimes it's muted because they just take the music out. There's all sorts of, of things that will happen to people's works. Um, YouTube's is the most famous. It is content ID and it's the most famous because it is where most video goes these days. It costs Google a hundred more than a hundred million dollars and it doesn't work which is why any idea that this is something that every website should be doing is is hilarious. Uh, YouTube's filter costs a hundred million dollars and it routinely gets things wrong. One of the, this isn't YouTube, this was Facebook. Facebook has a pretty severe problem, which was musicians you were using Facebook Live during the pandemic to show themselves playing classical music. It turns out, and classical music is not copyrighted. Mm -hmm. This isn't even fair use. The, pe the authors of the music have been dead for hundreds of years. It is no longer copyrighted. Anyone can play a piece by Bach. Um, but you can have a copyright in your recording of yourself playing Bach. And if you're Sony and you have a copyright in someone playing, like a Philharmonic playing some piece, and then someone else plays it on the themselves, the filter can't tell the difference because two people playing the same piece on the same instrument are gonna sound basically the same to the robot. And they have no contextual ability to say that's not the same. And so they were getting kicked out of Facebook Lives or their videos were being taken down because the robots couldn't tell the difference. And if they appealed, sometimes the uh, the rights holder would just had a like generic process of denying all appeals, and they were stuck. So that's that's sort of one aspect of it. Content ID uh, is a mess in a lot of ways. Um, people aren't making the best work that they can make because they're not making it based on what they have the right to use, they're making it based on what can get past content ID. So instead of using the best example for something, like if it's a video to teach you how to do something or to teach you the difference or to teach you a film technique, they're not gonna use the best example, they're gonna use the one that content ID doesn't take down. So you're actually, as a user mm -hmm. and a viewer, getting a lesser product because you are being tr given only what can make it past the filter, not what those people actually have a right to use. Um, they have to make sure that, like, they make sure that their clips that they're using, for example, are less than a certain number of seconds long, for example, um, which is probably not helpful if you're trying to teach someone something. Um, so that's one very 
uh, dangerous part of it. The other is YouTube's content ID is particularly sensitive to music because it's only looking at an audio file rather than an audio and visual file. And that can mean that if you are critiquing a clip of something and that clip has music in it, you can get dinged for the music even if you're not dinged for the clip. Music you didn't pick, music that's part of the clip that you're commenting on. The other part of it is that music reviewing, there are so many things on YouTube that are reviews, right? That's like one of the biggest sections of video. It's either a review of the news or a review of TV or movies or plays or anything. Music reviewing on YouTube is actually a much, much smaller segment than you would think given how important music is, how much reviewer, how much music criticism exists. But it's because content ID is incredibly sensitive to music and it may not take videos down, but it will demonetize them or it will take that money away from the creator and give it to the major labels, which is ridiculous. That's that's just patently ridiculous. It's never been a thing that the person whose work you are reviewing should get a cut of what the money you're being paid for that <laughs> review. That's that's bizarre. Um. <laughs> And it's, it's just not a good system. That is not something they have the right to claim the money for. And it means that fewer people go into reviewing that work and, and allows you to sort of get away with more in a sense. Cause you don't, you don't get the, the criticism from the multitude of points of view that, that you would normally get. It's only going to be in those outlets that do music criticism rather than sort of homegrown criticism done on YouTube. Um, I had someone tell me like, you just don't do content about music or you don't expect to make money on content on music because you know that's not gonna be how it goes. I also spoke to someone who was writing a video that was criticizing a cartoon and the studio that made it had content ID set to every time it detected a match to block the video entirely. And what that studio said on their website was, if that happens, we do this with the expectation that you'll contact us and we'll work out an agreement. That's also not how that works. Fair use allows you to use things without permission or payment. You you don't need to work out an agreement to, your, to do this work, but because of content ID, the video gets blocked until they contact them. And, and what they will do is if you contact them, the agreement they'll come up with is they'll let you have the video go up, but they'll keep all the profits from it. Um, which for this reviewer was particularly annoying because A, they had written this to critique it and they were going to donate the proceeds of the video to an organization fighting the thing they were saying was in the cartoon. And they couldn't do mm -hmm. that because of the way it was set up. It's just like, it's a, a fundamentally bizarre and wage thefty system that, that exists on YouTube for, for many people. How, how do you see this playing out in the future? Because you and, and EFF, you, you make a very compelling case against this automated, automated uploading filters. Uh, but what we see is in Europe under the, uh, EU copyright directive, we see that larger pr platforms will be obliged to rely on these automated upload filters to comply with it. And um, in a recent piece, you've actually warned against the US Copyright Office uh, being inspired by this uh, by this evolution in, in Europe. Um, so what you see, what, what you see happen will will um, can anything be done against this or? It is it is doomed to, to failure. It's a bad idea. Um, if what you, with all of the uproar about big tech companies, uproar I agree with, the problem with these filters is, as I said, they're expensive and they don't work. So, A, you're going to be silencing speech, that's, that is flat out going to violate people's, people's right to free expression. 
uh, by mandating it. The other thing is that the only platforms for whom these filters are cost effective are the large ones. The only platforms um, who make enough money who can can either afford to restrict their user base or afford these filters are going to be the large platforms. So it disincentivizes any competition in the space, even more than it already was. And a number of plat like there's a there's a platform called Nebula right now um, that is being designed with a mind towards being more what creators want to use to put their videos up, that it's less, um, it has fewer robots. It has more, it is more inclusive. You can, you can say curse words on it, whereas YouTube will downrank you in the algorithm if you have too much adult material in it all of those things. And that's a good thing. That's what you want to see. If YouTube is not serving the people who make videos well, and it isn't, they should have the option of going somewhere else. But when you require filters, you're, you're basically requiring a thing that only makes sense if you're large enough to absorb the cost. Or if you're large enough that the fact that you're going to be censoring a large number of videos doesn't really affect your bottom line. And so that's, that's, that's like, that's one consequence is that the, the other being, of course, the extreme censorship that comes with that. Um, these filters are bad. Um, they have no, in order to be compliant with the law, there's no reason to write a filter that is under-inclusive, you want to write them to be as over-inclusive and as broad as possible so that you don't accidentally let something through and, and violate the law. So instead, they are designed to be oversensitive. Um, in this for a number of reasons, not the least of which is because a independent person saying something online doesn't have uh, the money to bring a lawsuit against a company the way a giant rights holder does. Mm -hmm. If you're Google, your fear isn't that a famous YouTuber sues you, because even in that case, they, they don't have a ton of money. Your fear is that Disney sues you, in which case you are up against a company that has the money and the money and time and resources to really fight you on this. So it's better to design filters that make that side happy rather than one that works for users and for creators. Mm-hmm. You're already touching part of my, what, what my next question is going to be, like how much of a problem is this monopoly and concentration of power in big tech and the online world? Um, you, you've, you've written a piece about this as well, to which we will also link um, um, in, the, in the metadata of this, uh, of this uh, episode. Um, is this really, is this going to be, is this, ever going to go away the fact that the concentration of power has so much influence on copyright issues i think one of the the major problems isn't just that big tech is monolithic although that is a huge problem another is that creativity has also been pretty highly concentrated um the, the promise of the internet was that it lowered barriers to entry. I could make a film myself, upload it to YouTube and have people see it. Um, I could make music and release it online. Um, the technology was cheaper. I could do it from home. I didn't need a studio. But what's happened is that the reaction from the major labels and from Hollywood hasn't been, then we should be better. We should treat artists better so they want to come work with <laughs> us and have access to resources. The reaction has been, let's shut it down. Then we should shut it down. Um, and they bring a lot of, of pressure to bear on this and they co-opt um, some real problems. They often co-opt into this fight 
um, the problems facing newspapers and and local news. Um, as someone who used to be a journalist, I find that incredibly galling. Uh, those are different problems. Those are not the same. The problems facing news outlets online has to do with the concentration of the ad market in Google and Facebook. And it is not because Google and Facebook have something to do with copyright. And the movie industry until the COVID, until the, the they were posting record profits until COVID hit. So it's clearly people making things and putting them online is clearly not impacting their bottom line that much. People still want to go to movie theaters. Uh, they still want to see things uh, in that in that system, but it's so it's to me it's less about even money or or anything. It's about control. It's about the idea that you shouldn't be able to do anything without going through a mega corporation, which is absurd. That's just absurd. And it's really frustrating. Um, so for this fight, on the one hand, you've got the mega corporations that own content. And then on the other side, you used to have platforms. Um, but a lot of those platforms are now rights holders in their their own uh, right. Facebook keeps trying to make shows. Uh, YouTube keeps trying to make shows. So they're no longer as like opposite sides as they'd like you to believe. But by demonizing, by jumping on the very real problems of the big tech, the the big content has managed to slip its desire for control into this broader problem of big tech. I work on competition. I think I think this is a I think the concentration in big tech is a severe problem, not the least of which because no one wants to build anything new because they can't compete with billion dollar companies. Um, but that's that's not a problem that is really affecting Disney. That's and to, to for them to put position themselves against Google and Facebook just because people don't like Google and Facebook now is disingenuous to the extreme. Okay. Kudos for the cats in the background, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she she loves a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> So uh, let's jump back in time for, for um, a short final question. Um, so uh, you've recently reflected on, on SOPA and uh, PIPA, which is the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act from about 10 years ago. It seems like a, it's, it feels like a century ago. Um, but 10 years ago, um, a coalition of internet users, nonprofit groups and internet companies were very successful actually in stopping these controversial bills um, because um, these bills included provisions for internet service providers to block websites and actual actual prison penalties for unauthorized streaming of copyrighted content. Um, maybe you've read because you've you've written about you've um, you've written about this recently. Um, could you just briefly tell us like how important this victory was? Um, now looking back at, back at it 10 years later and also like are the ideas behind these bills still looming around? I mean, I guess the answer to that last question is yes, judging on your answers to the previous questions. Yeah, <laughs> it was really important, at least in the United States, it taught Congress that the Internet was a force. This was pretty early on in the idea of of the Internet as as a force to be reckoned with. Um, it, like when it was announced, when Sopa Pippa was f first came up, it wasn't seen as super controversial within Congress. They were like, yeah, of course, everyone thinks piracy is bad. And, and Hollywood is telling us this is what we have to do to help them. And we, you know, we love our movies and we want to protect them. And they didn't anticipate the backlash and they didn't anticipate that huge numbers of people understood what happens when sites are blocked because of so-called copyright infringement. They didn't anticipate the fact that so many people have experienced the thing where they go online, they want to watch something um, 
and it's like not copyright infringement they want to watch their favorite youtuber or something or they want to see a gif or whatever and they are met with the this has been removed due to copyright grounds so they they didn't understand that most people at this point most internet users which is most people have had contact with copyright controls online and had negative contact and knew it was uh, knew it was used for censorship, knew that it removed things that they wanted to see, and knew that something this draconian would just lead to there being a less rich internet. And so it was really important in that. Um, the, the problem has been that as more and more people leave Congress, actually, the group that remembers that and takes it seriously is dwindling. Um, and so you have to sort of remind them. The other thing that's changed uh, is at the time, you know, Google and all of these companies were on the same side as users and users were all standing together with those companies. At, if something like this happened again, even if the companies didn't like it, I don't necessarily know that I'd want them to be on our side. <laughs> Uh, because, as I said, the, the other side has sort of weaponized the, the way that people don't like those companies to make arguments for things that have nothing to do with the reasons those companies are bad. Nothing mm -hmm. to do with Amazon's abuse of its workers, nothing to do with Google and Facebook gutting the ad market or Facebook manipulating data, telling uh, news people to make videos and then revealing that that was a whole lie and it gutted newsrooms. None of that, uh, or the fact that all these companies uh, buy all their competitors before they get too big to compete with them. None of that has anything to do with copyright. Um, and the other side just makes sure that people don't think past well if it's bad for google facebook amazon then it must be good for everyone which it isn't even bad for them those companies probably wouldn't care mm -hmm. they have filters they just have to turn them on even <laughs> higher um it would just be bad for users the the question about like are those ideas still around yeah um content really wants site blocking and they always have um it's always funny to me in a sense that they want site blocking because they're the ones who are always arguing that the internet is a whack-a-mole and they can't take things down fast enough before they pop up. I don't I don't know how they think site blocking will work better than than other things. Um but they site blocking would would just take down a bunch of legitimate speech because for most of these sites, mm -hmm. again, they're hosting third party content. Actual infringement to legitimate speech is small. And if you block the entire site over it, if you block all of YouTube because because of that, you're losing a lot. Um, you're also losing a lot because, as I said, YouTube's the only game in town. So there are so few mm -hmm. sites now that can really handle this that to bring up site blocking is really detrimental. There's a, a thing worse than site blocking that has popped up, which is the idea that most people reject and hopefully most courts would reject that this, that the site blocking should also apply to ISPs. That if, someone is going online and pirating, their access to the internet should be terminated. That's that's a huge, massive hammer for, for a non-existent nail. Um, as we have seen during the pandemic, being able to go online is incredibly important. It is not just like a luxury to be enjoyed. It is how we live and work and do all sorts of things. And at least in the United States, most Americans don't have a choice for their internet service provider. So if they get kicked off, they're done. That's it. There's nowhere mm -hmm. else to go. Um, they might have, you know, their phone, but their phone won't have the same high speed quality as a high-speed broadband internet connection. It's it's not a substitute, especially not in the Zoom era. And that came up in 
the so in the the copyright office did their own report on the section 512 of the DMCA and they mentioned it and they kind of glossed over the fact that it would be so harmful they said that it wouldn't be that it would be harmful if universities did it because for people living in university housing, it's their only internet access. And that they have special need, like students and professors have a special need to be online, which is different from the rest of us in what way? If you don't live in student housing, but you live in an apartment and you need to get online for school and you only have one internet provider in your neighborhood, how is that different? Um, so that's, that's the other thing that came up that I don't think anyone seriously believes is a thing but the fact that it was treated as a serious uh, the fact that the copyright office treated it as if it was mm -hmm. an actual thing was concerning because it, it meant that they thought that that's where the bar was whereas that shouldn't even be discussed and dismissed it should not even have come up um so i, I a lot of times you see these companies just ex like desperately arguing that there needs to be more filtering. And then you have a lot of mm -hmm. sort of grifters, because that's how the internet works, who say like, oh, no, no, I've built this filter and it works perfectly. It's like, there's no way. As, as I said, Google, with all of its money, has poured time and energy into Content ID and it's terrible. If 10 hours of static Go got a bunch of copyright claims hit on it because <laughs> the sound of static is in many things. Like, what do we, that's a, that's a, why do we think that this system is good? <laughs> that's what, I mean, I, I would like to follow this with a, with a more personal question. Uh, something I ask all of my interviewees. Is. So this this interview will appear on a blog called Walt Culture. Um, and what I would like to know is like, is there a particular moment for you personally when you hit that wall um, and you thought like, oh, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong with, with how copyright works. Yeah. Um, it's for a lot of people i think it it might be this um i wasn't particularly into it at the time but i was i was a very online child and if you were online and if you were specifically online in like fandom spaces as i was you saw a thing happened a lot in anytime someone made a fan creation if it's art if it's a fan vid or if it's fan fiction, there would be this like disclaimer about how they don't own the characters, how they're not making any money from this, how there's no infringement intended, please don't sue them. And that, that seemed wild to me. It seemed wild to me that anyone would be worried about that. And if you delve into the history of it and you learn about Anne Rice, you learn very quickly that there was a reason to be afraid if you were a fan creator. Um, and there was a reason to think that your favorite author might sue you or at least send a very scary legal letter to you if you expressed your fandom in your own creative way, which is wild to me and, and an incredibly strange thing to me because those are the people you should want to be treating well. Those are your biggest fans. They are the people the most committed to the world you have built. Um, and that's that's really when I started getting interested in copyright because it was really affecting the online spaces that, that I was in and people were really reacting to it in, in bizarre and like, almost like folk culture ways. Like, I know as someone mm -hmm. who's been to law school that a disclaimer does nothing. Copyright isn't an intent. Copyright infringement isn't an intent based law. You don't have to have an intent to infringe a copyright to be found liable. Um, but people were doing these disclaimers almost as like a folk charm against being sued. And I, I found that very 
very interesting and and weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Um, looking at the future, so we, we've talked about the problems with copyright legislation, legislation mainly in the US, but also in Europe, and its failure to adapt to the digital era. Um, what I want to know from you is how can we make this work in an online and connected world? What needs to change? How can we try to make this happen? In other words, maybe like what should your ideal 2030 look like if you're an optimist? And if you're a pessimist, what are you afraid of 2030 will look like? Um, I am, I am always, always afraid of, of upload filter mandates, um, of any kind, mainly to not just because the filters are bad, but because governments historically aren't great at understanding the way technology works and are even worse at predicting where it will go. So laws based on their understanding of technology go very poorly, very quickly. Um, in my ideal world, YouTube wouldn't be big. There would be many different platforms for people um, because then people aren't the, the problem with YouTube isn't just content ID. It's also that because it's the only game in town, you have to play whatever their game is. So whatever their algorithm mm -hmm. is doing, you need to be serving it. Um, which is terrible. Whatever their advertisers are are asking for, you have to make sure you don't. The algorithms are built to be friendly to the advertisers. That's terrible. If if there were many smaller ones, and two, if they were you know niche built, you would know exactly what you were getting when you went to different places, and that's that's the goal. I say the same thing about Facebook. It. And I say it all the time. People are always like, why Facebook should do more moderation. It's like, I don't want Facebook to do more moderation because I don't trust Facebook to do moderation. <laughs> um, what I want to do is not have to be on Facebook, is not feel like I have to be on Facebook because everyone's on Facebook. Uh, the example I always give is Ravelry, which is the knitting website, has some really strong rules about what you are and aren't allowed to talk about because... There, it's a it's a website for knitting and it's volunteer run and they don't want to have to moderate bizarre political conspiracies. That's not what the website's for. It's for knitting, and so they've instituted pretty strong rules about what people can and can't say, and that's fine because that's why you would go to Ravelry. I'm going to Ravelry for a knitting pattern, not for people screaming conspiracy theories. Um, I don't go anywhere for that. Um, it would be great if I had more options of places where that did not happen. Uh, unfortunately, there are only a few places. Um, so I, I would like to see people not, f not these, these websites ex are powerful because they are big and they are big because there was nowhere else to go. So if there were other places to go, that would be, that's the dream. Um, similarly, as it stands right now for copyright, um, the reason I wrote a paper on, on content ID was because you have, I had the most data for it because YouTube has been around for a while. Um, people have talked about it constantly, but also because as the largest video based system, it, it's filter has a huge effect. But if people didn't feel like they had to be on YouTube, and many creators I talk to are on YouTube because that's the only option, not because they want to be. They don't make their money from YouTube, in fact. They make their money from Patreon. But in order to make money from Patreon, they have to be on YouTube mm -hmm. to get enough people to subscribe to their Patreon. And if they didn't have to do that, they would actually be happier. If they could make money off of ads on a different platform with maybe smaller viewership, but they would be taking home more of that money than they do on YouTube, I think they'd be equally happy because then they, they wouldn't have to also have a Patreon and do all of that. Um, so it, my dream is many smaller platforms, places where you get to decide what experience you as either a creator or even just an audience mm -hmm. member want, rather than being like, I, I guess it's YouTube. I guess that's the option. That's, that's not, that can't be the future. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, Katherine, for this interview. I thought it was very interesting.
Is there anything else you'd like to share before we close? Unfortunately, I see your cat has disappeared. I was hoping she was coming back to say hi. Oh, uh, she's on the she's behind me. I can see her. <laughs> it's her birthday today, in fact. Okay. <laughs> I got an oh. email from the vet. <laughs> Okay, so anything else you would like to share? Anything we, we, we should have touched no. and we didn't touch? No, I think we covered most things. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, then there remains uh, nothing for me left to just uh, wish you a very nice day and uh, to the listeners, uh, stay tuned for the next episode of this podcast. <laughs> This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.